Good morning and welcome. Uh, Chairman Goodlatte is stuck in Washington traffic. That should come as no surprise for those of you who live here. Um, this happens to all of us. I am Richard Williams. I'm the director of the Regulatory Studies Program at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. It's my honor to welcome you this morning to our educational program, and we're going to examine the relationships between regulation and the economy. As most of you all know, regulation is a powerful legal and economic tool that touches nearly every aspect of our daily lives. The problem is its significance is largely hidden from the public. Uh, most people simply don't understand exactly how powerful this is, but we hope to shed a little light on this today. Policymakers in particular need to be aware of the impact of regulations, not just on the national economy, but also on individuals. And, and when I'm talking about individuals, I mean individuals as consumers, as innovators, as investors, as business owners, as people who want to be business owners, and households that are just trying to keep the bills paid. The purpose of regulation is to solve problems that people are unable to solve in their own personal life. But successful problem solving through regulation requires that regulate, regulators and all decision makers have access to information. And that information basically has to point to, does the regulation have a chance to work? What's the probability that it'll actually solve a problem? And then after we put it in place, what's the probability that it's actually working? We can go and look and see if it's working. But before we even do that, first we have to make sure that regulation is addressing a real problem. So for example, we need to be aware that the problems that uh, government used to have to fix was one where consumers had less information about what they were purchasing than the sellers. Now, in the age of the internet, that problem is largely disappearing. The problem that we see at Mercatus, through our 20 to 30 years of work now uh, on regulations, is that a lot of regulators simply don't have good enough information before they decide to regulate. They need both good information and good analysis. And when they don't have that, they end up basically regulating in the dark. And when we do that, we make, dis we make uh, decisions on regulations that often don't work. And when regulations don't work, that means that resources are being spent to comply with regulations that could have otherwise been spent on something productive. It also means that we're setting up unnecessary barriers to innovation. So the key is, in order to get regulations at work, we need good information, we need good analysis, and that will lead to better uh, investment and innovation decisions. The title of our program this morning is Unleashing an Economic Resurgence Through Regulatory Reform. This morning, our speakers and scholars will make some connections between federal regulation and the effects on the economy. We will talk about what the effects are and also how can we do better. Um, eventually, we will stop this program when Chairman Goodluck gets here and I will introduce him. But first, I want to introduce my colleague, Bill Beach. Uh, some of you may know he used to work somewhere near here, I think. Uh, but right now, he is the Vice President for Policy Research at the Mercatus Center for George Mason University. So, Bill, take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be with you on this panel. And I'd like to call uh, my uh, fellow panelists for the first panel up, up to the stage now, Pietro Pareto, Adam Millsap, and Dustin Chambers, uh, three distinguished individuals that I will introduce in just a moment. You know, we're here today in this first panel to talk about the question, how can reform help economic growth? How can regu regulatory reform help economic growth? You're going to hear uh, some research announced this morning which is truly pathbreaking. A constant question, you know, all across the country from Chambers of Commerce to Congress is how can we get more jobs? It's, uh, when I worked in the Senate, I wrote every other speech on jobs as Marcus Peacock, my former boss, knows he edited all of those. Before we can answer this question, we need, to, we need to understand, though, how jobs are linked to economic growth, how economic growth is influenced by government policy. Uh, most policymakers in Washington and state capitals have a have kind of a basic understanding of the likely effects of higher tax rates on economic growth, on the output of capital, output of labor, and so forth and so on, but not so on regulation. Uh, we've ignored that, I think, to our peril. Now, uh, happily, the neglect of regulation's role in shaping public, uh, in shaping economic growth is really sort of slowly disappearing. Uh, I've noticed that in my long years up here. More and more lawmakers are recognizing that regulations can, for example, raise specific costs, direct cost barriers to launching and expanding a business and force businesses to spend more than they planned on technology and infrastructure. And this is the subject matter of the first panel. And we're going to really discuss a number of things along three lines of inquiry. And 
now my panelists may decide to take this in a different direction, but we'll be, we'll be working in, uh, in that area. Uh, and I'll say a few more words on that when we resume. How do you like that? Chairman Goodlad is here. Um, he's here. That's excellent. How are you, sir? Uh, to start our program, we want to thank the Honorable Bob Goodlatte, who is the chair of the Committee on the Judiciary uh, and representative of Virginia's 6th District, which I want to point out is the home of the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's the most heavily visited uh, national park in, uh, in the world, actually. And he's going to begin this important discussion. As an attorney and member of the House of Representatives, Chairman Goodlatte has extensive experience with both legislative and the regulatory process and the daily effects of regulation on all Americans. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Chairman Goodlatte. Well, thank you very much and good morning and my apologies for being uh, a few minutes late. The, uh, the rain makes the traffic slow down and that slowed me down. But uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning and uh, uh, just when you think everyone knows who you are because you're an elected official, you get your comeuppance. Uh, during the great health care debate of a few years ago, I was visiting a nursing home in my district, and I saw a lady sitting there, and I went up to her, and I said, do you know who I am? And she looked at me, and she said, no, but if you ask at the nurse's station, they might be able to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today to consider how to unleash an economic resurgence through regulatory reform. And we have an esteemed group of experts assembled, and I am happy to launch our discussion. Looks like I almost missed that opportunity, but uh, I am uh, uh, pleased to be able to do that. There are a few matters more. There are a few matters more vital to our nation right now and into the future than the search of for how to unleash a resurgence of our economy. The American people are now four elections and more than seven years into the worst period after an economic crisis since the Great Depression. But ever since America emerged from the recession, it has witnessed a recovery like no other and not in a good way. For most, if not all, of the recovery, we have witnessed jobs not truly recovering, wages not truly recovering, and the rate of new business startups not truly recovering. Instead, we've seen permanent exits from the labor force at historic levels, real wages falling, and dependency on government assistance increasing. All across this country, people have been struggling. People whose jobs and wages have been disappearing, people who have been leaving the labor pool for the dependency pool, people who have seen no way possible to start a new business have been feeling in their bones that the American dream, the dream that they cherish and their children need, is slipping away. They are feeling that a future of prosperity is slipping out of their grasp. What's behind this? It is not a lack of American resources. It is not a lack of American ingenuity. It is not a lack of American spirit. And it is certainly not unbeatable foreign competition. More than anything else, it is the endless drain of resources that takes working people's hard-earned wages to Washington and bureaucratically impose regulatory roadblocks in the path of opportunity and growth. Today, the combined economic burden of federal taxation and regulation is over $3 trillion, almost 20% of our economy. Of that, the larger part is the burden of regulation, now estimated to reach at least $1.88 trillion. That federal regulatory burden is larger than the 2013 gross domestic product of all but the top 10 countries in the world. It is half the size of Germany's entire GDP. It is more than one-third the size of Japan's GDP. Most important, that burden is $15,000 per American household, nearly 30% of average household income. No one says we need no regulation, but who can credibly say we need regulation that costs this much? America cannot possibly retain its competitive position in the world 
and create opportunity and prosperity for all Americans if the federal government continues to drop such a crushing weight on our economy. Much of this burden has accumulated over decades. As the authors of one of the studies that will be discussed today have shown, the cumulative effects of regulation have slowed economic growth in the United States by, on average, eight-tenths of a percent per year since 1980. Slightly less than one percent per year at first blush may not sound like much, but we all need to understand that it is. What it means is that if we had held regulation constant at 1980 levels, the U.S. economy would have been roughly 25 percent larger than it actually was by 2012. That's the equivalent of $4 trillion per year, or about $13,000 per person per year. Rather than reversing the trend of accumulating regulatory burdens, the Obama administration has accelerated it. Imagine what our recovery could have been like if we had been able to reclaim a significant share of that lost growth. But rather than reverse the trend of accumulating regulatory burden to let the economy breathe, the Obama administration has brought us an unprecedented avalanche of new and costly regulation. The regulatory onslaught is a major reason why we have just concluded eight years of zero, zero real wage growth for America's workers and families. It is a critical reason why well over 90 million Americans above the age of 16 are out of the workforce. It is an unmistakable reason why we are still missing the almost 6 million more new jobs Americans would have had if the so-called Obama recovery had just been as strong as the average recovery since World War II. Things do not have to continue this way. We can unleash an economic resurgence through regulatory reform. All one has to do is take a look at the flaws in how Washington's regulators currently do business to see why that is true. Washington's regulatory bureaucracy rarely knows both the monetized costs and the monetized benefits of even new major regulations that it issues. Frequently, the benefits claimed for new regulation are not the direct benefits. Congress directly sought when it passed the relevant regulatory statutes. Instead, they are purported co-benefits, side effects that the bureaucracy argues serve some other end. Imagine how much more efficient and less unnecessarily burdensome our regulatory system would be if we enacted reform that forced agencies to stop shooting in the dark and stop shooting sideways, requiring them to actually show the true monetized costs and benefits of proposed alternatives and prohibiting excessive reliance on claimed co-benefits. Or consider that, notwithstanding the size and growth of federal regulation, no regulatory budgeting mechanism provides Congress with the ability to manage the level of new federal regulatory costs imposed each year. Other nations, meanwhile, have successfully implemented the use of regulatory budgeting to control excess regulation and regulatory costs. Surely we can motivate effective regulatory budgeting tools that could bend the regulatory cost curve down without hampering the realization of regulatory benefits. Further, consider that Washington regulators rarely take into adequate account the adverse impacts their regulations have on the rate of new business startups, the depressing impacts regulations have on jobs and wages, the long-term harmful impacts regulations have on displaced workers, their families, and their communities, and the regressive impacts of regulation on poor and lower income communities who often see their electricity rates or other household expenses take a disproportionately hard hit from new regulation, or the cumulative impact these factors have on economic mobility. It's long past time that Congress required regulatory agencies to work much harder to account for these factors and avoid these adverse impacts as they write new regulations. And I look forward to a productive discussion of these issues today and hope that today's proceedings increase all of our dedication to achieve regulatory reform that can provide a true economic resurgence for our country. Thank you all for letting me be with you today.
Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. As somebody who's been in the regulatory business now for 35 years, that's about as good a summary as I think anybody could do. Um, so we here at the Mercatus Center use an economics toolkit to look at regulations. And like everybody else, and like uh, the chairman just mentioned, I think this is a conversation that's taking place across the country, uh, in, you know, across the internet, and in homes, and in workplaces. Uh, to begin our discussion, our first panel is going to discuss all of the connections between rec uh, regulations and economic growth. In particular, they're gonna, we're going to start with looking at regulations' effect on the national economy, then we're going to move to the effect on, on the individual states, and finally, we're going to look at the effect on right down to the household level. And for those of you who believe that all politics is local, you will be particularly interested probably in that uh, third discussion. So again, let me turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Bill Beach. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll stand up. thank you very much, Chairman Good Goodlad. You actually hit the points that we were hitting before you came in. <laughs> so, so, so no, no, no. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a, uh, it was a godsend. Um, what a great way of starting this discussion. We have three great panelists for the first panel, and let me introduce each one, and then I'll call on Pietro to begin our discussion. Uh, our first speaker is Pietro Pareto, who is a professor of economics at, uh, at uh, Duke University. Uh, he has written extensively in this area of technological change and its connections to economic growth and macroeconomics, um, the environment, uh, R&D, all these f factors like international trade and innovation and so forth. And he is the uh, co-author of a, uh, a paper which was released just a couple of days ago and that will be the subject of his remarks today, an extraordinary demonstration of how we can estimate uh, regulatory, cumulative regulatory burden within an economic model. He'll be followed by Adam Millsap, who is a research fellow in state and local uh, a policy project at Mercatus, a colleague of mine. Uh, Adam has conducted research in urban development and growth, population trends, federal and local urban policy and has written extensively in all those areas and published with us. He has a PhD in economics from Clemson, a BS in economics and a BA in comparative religion from Miami University. And our last speaker on this panel will be Dustin Chambers, who's associate professor at Salisbury University. Um, he is, uh, earned his PhD from the University of California, Riverside. Uh, he has a, uh, distinguished record in econometric studies in this area of, uh, of economic growth and has looked at uh, how uh, economic growth convergence rates across countries uh, have, um, have, have occurred and, and why they have occurred you know, the way they have. So without further ado, uh, Pietro, would you start us off, please? Yes. Can I should I come to the podium? No, Where that's okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. And, um, I think my role is probably to play the academic and uh, put the study that um, uh, we are going to discuss in context. Uh, taking it from the, a long run view, the, um, the problem for many, many years, uh, people knew that we needed to understand better innovation, technical change in economics. Uh, there was no doubt that that's the engine of growth. Uh, for many years, however, we lacked the proper theory to study it in particular if the models were supposed to be used to study regulation, uh, the interaction between the economy and environment, uh, and uh, um, topics like that. Uh, luckily, roughly 30 years ago, uh, Paul Romer gave us a breakthrough. He showed the profession how to write uh, dynamic general equilibrium models of the entire economy that allowed for uh, endogenous technological change and pointed us in the right direction. 30 years later, we are still working very hard. It's a collective intellectual journey uh, with many people involved, uh, asking various questions, uh, uh, exploring dimensions of the models that can be improved and that uh, uh, need to be changed in order to make progress in some areas. Um, <clears throat> my contribution in particular here has been to take seriously the idea that technical change comes from the activities of firms. and. Uh, possibly modeled in a way that people coming from outside economics will recognize immediately. Institutions that specialize in production, in, uh, they have an internal organization, and part of their activity is what we call research and development, bringing to markets new goods, improving their productivity, and all these sorts of things. 
Of course, when we, think, when we look at the real economy, we see that there is another big dimension of economic dynamism related to technological change, which is entrepreneurship. Uh, agents, we call them entrepreneurs, typically are individuals or collection of individuals that get together, have some vision about uh, a product that might sell in the market, and uh, spend resources on developing the product, the process, they do marketing campaign, and then they set up an institution, a firm that uh, serves the market. So we want to understand in the context of the entire economy how these uh, two activities, innovation, incremental innovation in particular, internal to the firm, and entrepreneurship, setting up new firms, um, are affected by the overall economic environment and how they uh, produce the technical change that is the key to our living standards. Um, regulation has always been very hard to introduce in these environments because uh, many models were not sufficiently tractable. And what I have in mind here is precisely the, the, the Goldilocks rule, if you want, that the model shouldn't be too hard or shouldn't be too simple. Too simple, it doesn't help you understand a complex reality. Too hard, you don't understand the model, and then it becomes useless to use it to interpret reality. Uh, I'm happy to report from the trenches of academic research that we have made enough progress to produce models that are extremely tractable, and then now are easily adjusted, tailored to study the problem of regulation. The study that uh, um, uh, we conducted with uh, Patrick and Bentley, Bentley is a former student of mine at Duke, uh, graduated 10, 15 years ago, um, the study that we, uh, that we did uh, uh, exploits two major, in my opinion, advances uh, that are available today. The first and most important, in my opinion, is the data that uh, the Mercatus Group uh, collected. Uh, it's a great data set. It's sorely needed. Uh, I keep arguing that we need something like that on the benefit side of things because at the moment we, we have evidence that allows us to think in an organized fashion about the potential benefits of regulation that uh, is scattered across industries, is not collected in a consistent fashion across time, industries, and their activities. What they did with the reg data the, the, um, project is they finally uh, accomplished a consistent measure of regulation that uh, can be deployed to study the entire economy. And then uh, the other uh, advance is on the theory side. Essentially, that's where I come in into the picture because I develop models that uh, uh, are so tractable that you can solve by hand that uh, you see immediately what happens in these models. When you study, uh, when you use them to try to understand what happens to the growth rate of the economy over time as a, uh, a result of the regulatory environment, the model produces transparent analytical answers that you understand, and then you can do empirical exercises like the one that we did in this paper, which is an estimation exercise, uh, for practical reasons focused only on the cost side of things. We didn't even start thinking about benefits because of the lack of data that I mentioned a minute ago. To our surprise, the number ca that came up is pretty big, and uh, uh, I take it as a, as a signal that uh, we are after the big fish, and that uh, we need to work more. There are more papers to write, which is good for me. It keeps me employed. <laughs> and um, mostly because uh, good theory is also a device that focuses your attention and uh, helps you frame uh, new questions or reframe old questions in a more uh, specific and, and precise way. Uh, I think I can stop here because I provided enough context. And... Um, well, that's just outstanding, and, and we'll return to um, the findings in the model and to reg data, which I think we should we should spay, uh, spend a few more minutes on, so that everyone understands what what a breakthrough that that was. Adam, I'm going to stand over here because I like standing better. So, and you are better looking than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so. My comments today are going to focus on why federal regulation impacts the 50 states and then Washington, D.C. in different ways. Um, so first, it's necessary to point out a fact about the U.S. economy. Firms in the same industry tend to cluster together in the same area. All right. Some examples of this, Silicon Valley in California, um, the financial services sector in New York City, automobile manufacturing in Michigan, and then the uh, film industry in Los Angeles. The two primary economic causes of this clustering 
are economies of scale and agglomeration economies. So I'm going to briefly explain those two things. So a firm has economies of scale when the average cost of producing a good declines as more is produced. And a primary reason for this is specialization. As more of a good is produced, it makes economic sense to have different workers focus on different individual tasks. As an example of this, I worked at a GM plant one summer when I was in college, and my job was to install gas tanks on the cars as they went down the assembly line. Um, it, makes sense, it made sense at the time to have me focus on doing this one task because we were producing 500 cars per shift. So with each of us there focusing on just one job, the car could quickly move down the assembly line and we would each get you know, perfect at doing our individual job. This reduced waste, reduced mistakes, and then also cut costs. So the uh, combination of more output for a given amount of overhead and less mistakes decreases the average cost of producing a product and leads to large firms that end up employing hundreds or even thousands of workers, all of whom live in proximity to one another. So this is the beginning of a city and also a firm cluster. The second cause is the existence of agglomeration economies. So one feature of agglomeration economies is that workers tend to be more productive when they are surrounded by other workers in the same industry. Often this is due to knowledge spillovers, which simply means that workers in different firms in the same industry share knowledge with one another, and then this leads, in, leads to increases in productivity. Um, the increases in productivity then induce other firms in the same industry to locate near one another. So another agglomeration economy is when a large number of employers and employees are together. This leads to better job matching, which can increase productivity and then decrease a firm's cost associated with finding new employees. So together, the economies of scale and agglomeration economies generate firm clusters in specific areas. Geography and natural resources also play a role in an area of specialization. Hawaii and Florida have relatively large tourism industries due to their nice weather. West Virginia is a large, has a large mining industry due to its endowment of coal. So together with the agglomeration economies and specialization in geography and resources, we see these firm clusters. This is possible within the U.S. because residents of states are free to trade with one another. It's not necessary for each state to produce all of the things that its residents want. And so instead, states can specialize and produce certain goods and services and then trade across state borders for the other things that the residents in a particular state want to consume. Since firms tend to, in particular industries, tend to cluster together, Federal regulations that disparately impact certain industries will also disparately impact certain states. This is an inevitable outcome of specialization and unrestricted interstate commerce. This does not, however, mean that industries are forever bound to particular states. So an industry may concentrate in a new state for a variety of reasons. One is that new methods of production can change the relative attractiveness of a particular state. An example of this is shale and natural gas in the Dakotas in the Midwest largely displacing West Virginia coal as a input into the energy production process. A second is that changes in state and local policy may induce firms to relocate across state borders. There is evidence that states with simple tax codes and stable, lucid, regulatory environments tend to have better economies that are more attractive than to both people and firms. Third, Entrepreneurs are constantly inventing new products and services that displace old ones, and such innovation can occur in unlikely places. State policymakers cannot ensure that productive innovation takes place in their state, but states that implement a simpler tax code and regulatory environment will, will create the conditions that are necessary for uh, innovation, which makes it more likely that industry-changing innovation occurs in those states. Since in the long run, firms can and will move in response to these various factors, Federal regulations that impact an industry in one, straight, one state will follow that industry to others. Um, in the front, maybe some of you picked it up hopefully, there was a handout that shows the uh, five states with the largest share of U.S. employment in the most regulated industries according to the Federal Regulation and State Enterprise Index, phrase index for short, in both 1998 and 2014. So the phrase index is a way to calculate how federal regulation impacts the different states based on the industry makeup of those states. Also created by Patrick, we'll be talking later. Um, as you can see in that handout, over a span of 16 years, there were some changes in the location of employment in those industries. So the shaded states in the 1998 panel on the left were replaced by the shaded states in the 2014 panel on the right. As an example, in the air transportation industry, Georgia replaced Illinois as the number three state 
in terms of employment. In chemical manufacturing, Illinois and Ohio replaced New York and Pennsylvania respectively. They are now, so those two states, Illinois and Ohio, are now well positioned to increase their share of employment in chemical manufacturing as the industry grows and evolves since they now have the benefit of agglomeration economies on their side. Of course, the firms and employees in Illinois and Ohio will also have to contend with the federal regulation that followed that industry to their state. So while it may initially appear that federal regulations that impact a particular industry won't have much of an effect on a particular state, changes in the economy that cause firms and employment to relocate can alter that result. Because federal, reg federal regulations follow industries across state lines, policymakers from all states need to be aware of how the cumulative effect of regulation can harm an industry's growth. While individual regulations may be largely benign in terms of their effect on growth, the cumulative effect can severely hinder firms' ability to innovate and create new jobs and opportunities for residents. States that are more heavily burned by federal regulation due to their mix of industries will suffer larger negative impacts. As an example of this, I am currently working on a study that examines the labor market recoveries of Kentucky and its neighbors since the Great Recession. Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia have all experienced large drops in their labor forces since September of 2007, and they have yet to recover. It is not surprising that these states rank fifth, 21st, and eighth, respectively, in the phrase index, since regulations that hinder economic growth also limit workers' opportunities. Kentucky's poor ranking is largely due to its automotive industry, which is heavily regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. Ohio's low ranking is primarily due to its utilities industry, while West Virginia's poor ranking is due to its concentration of mining, which is heavily regulated by the Department of the Interior. When employment opportunities disappear, workers will move to states with better economies, such as those that are less impacted by federal regulation. They may choose to retire early, or in the worst case scenario, they may be forced to rely on family, friends, and public assistance to make ends meet. So in closing, I just want to emphasize three facts. Firms cluster together due to specialization and agglomeration economies. Number two, due to this clustering, federal regulations that disparately impact certain industries will necessarily disparately impact certain states. Any negative effects that come from the accumulation of regulation will then disproportionately harm certain states, weakening their economies and their labor markets. And third, since federal regulation follows industries across states, it is in every policymaker's interest to understand how the cumulative effect of regulation impacts an industry. After all, at some point, the heavily regulated industries may be large employers in your states. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we've, we've, we've heard from Pietro that the results of a model that estimates the cumulative effect of regulations has reduced national GDP by 25% in 2012 dollars. We just heard how differences in regula regulatory burden across states make a huge difference in where people migrate and where businesses migrate. And uh, Dustin now is going to talk to us about the regulatory effect on the families and the price system. So we're going from national, state, see the logic, to family. Dustin. Well, thank you so much for having me out today. Uh, I really, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, before I dive into my remarks, I just wanted to touch on uh, Pietro's results real quickly because when I saw the numbers a few days ago, something instantly came to my head. Uh, I teach primarily undergraduate students, and in our first lecture in macroeconomics, I put up a slide where I show them what living standards looked like around the world a century ago and what they look like today. And we have the beginning and the ending values and the rates of economic growth associated with each one of them. The fastest growing country in that group is Japan, which went from rags to riches, from a very undeveloped economy to one of the most developed economies on the planet. At the tail end of that particular slide is Bangladesh, and it had a growth rate per person of just under 1% per year. The United States, which is by far the world's largest economy, had a growth rate that was about 0.8 percentage points higher than Bangladesh a century ago. Fast forward an entire century, you get the difference between the US today 
in Bangladesh a century ago. Now, we started off wealthier than Bangladesh did, but you can see that when you have a very low growth rate, countries grow very slowly and they remain mired in poverty. So if you try to wrap your mind around what that number means, just think US versus Bangladesh. That's the difference in growth performance that we're talking about as a result of these regulations. Now, the reason I was uh, asked to come out today to speak with you was to address the issue of what impact the regulations have at the household level which is also a very interesting question, as uh, all of you have constituents that are interested in living standards right within your, your congressional districts. Um, so the, the, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is give you a little bit of a background, just so that you kind of understand what's been done up to this point, and then you can see the, the value added by the paper that I did with uh, Courtney Collins, which recently was released, I think, in April. Um, if you look at regulations in general, no one up here is arguing that uh, regulations are universally bad or that we should just take the Federal Register and burn it out on the, uh, in, the, uh, <laughs> in front of the Capitol building. Uh, but what is argued, and Patrick's actually spoken at length about this, and you can uh, seek him out and he can give you more information about it, uh, is that we need a better framework for evaluating regulations. It should be the case that if you have a regulation that's on the books, that it needs to be current. You know, we can't be regulating piston engine aircraft that don't exist anymore, for example. You know, is, is sorry, the particular regulation actually germane? Uh, it should also address a significant risk. If it's a small issue, it's probably not even worth regulating. The next thing that you need to look for is, uh, do the benefits of the regulations outweigh the costs? Or as my uh, handyman likes to say, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's an important issue because uh, perhaps there are benefits, but the unintended consequences outshadow those benefits. So you have to take that into account. And also, there's a lot of rule duplication. You have to make sure that you don't have two different regulations basically trying to regulate the same thing. You need a streamlining of the benefits. Now, when regulations fail the, the above tests that I just spoke about, okay, uh, bad things can happen, not surprisingly. Um, so uh, Diana Thomas at the Mercatus Center wrote a white paper looking at uh, the child care, uh, daycare uh, sector in particular. So most of the work that's been done up to this point has been case studies, looking at specific industries. The work that I did and that I'm gonna describe at the end of my comments actually looks at all consumer prices taken together. But if you look at a particular industry like daycare, you can see that regulations actually aren't terribly effective, but add to tremendous costs in that sector. So let me give you a few highlights. The first is that most of the current regulations dealing with daycare are what uh, Dr. Thomas referred to as structural measures. So these are things like uh, how large the daycare center is, things like uh, child staff ratios, the amount of uh, teacher education required in order to, to watch the kids. Now, if you juxtapose that with the child psychology literature, which is actually looks at child development outcomes, uh, so these are things like language development and academic skills in young people. They find that the things that most statistically significantly affect or have a real effect on those outcomes are unrelated to the things which federal regulations are uh, imposing upon those, those daycare centers. Um, so let me give you a few numbers. For example, if you were to allow a uh, child care worker to take care of one additional infant, so just increase that ratio by one child, you would reduce the annual cost of uh, daycare between $850 and $1,890 per year. So substantial savings just by having an additional child watched by a particular worker. Um, also, if you require a high school diploma for all caregivers, that raises the cost of uh, daycare between 20 and 40%. Now, if you're a wealthy household, maybe you don't care about that 20 to 40 percent, but there are a lot of low-income families for whom that's a tremendous expense. Um, most worryingly, they found that a 1 percent increase in the price of childcare 
reduces the employment of single mothers by between 0 0.3 and 1.1%. So some of the most vulnerable people in society, those people who have to purchase daycare in order to work and then take their entire paycheck to pay the daycare, basically are forced, in the, the paper found uh, a much higher proportion of them, get pushed into welfare. They don't want to go into welfare, but they can't afford the daycare, so they exit the labor force altogether. So that's just one particular industry. Let me go ahead and give you guys a uh, overview of the results that I had with uh, Courtney Collins. And we were trying to measure what's the overall impact of regulations on all consumer products. So like a, a basket of consumer products, if you will. Um, in order to do that, uh, what we did is we went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they published data on uh, expenditure by different item, different categories, uh, roughly 60 different categories, basically spanning the, the range from housing to groceries, everything that you might spend money on. Um, and they have data on income levels for five different income groups, the poorest 20%, the next 20%, so this would be uh, 20 to 40, the middle class, the next 20, and then the highest income 20% of households. So this lets us tease out, are there any kind of disparate effects of regulations on different income groups? Uh, what we found was that overall, uh, a 10% increase in regulations increased consumer prices by 0.6%. 87%. So basically, seven tenths of a percentage point increase in your, your total prices or expenditures as a result of having a 10% increase in regulations. Um, we also found, and this was very worrisome, is that if you look at every, particu every particular expenditure category and you look at the amount of regulations being imposed on those various categories and how volatile those prices are, that actually the poorest households spent 15.1 percentage points more of their income. So if you look at their, their monthly budget, 15.1 percentage points more were spent in those areas that were most volatile and subject to the highest levels of regulations. Um, and so it's not surprising that if you look at the overall rate of consumer inflation, it's highest for the poorest consumers in the United States. Uh, between 2000 and 2012, the annualized rate of inflation was 2.46% for the uh, poorest 20% uh, of households, and it was only 2.08% for the wealthiest households. And so this leads to a very interesting uh, yeah, potential question that you could ask, what would be the impact of reducing uh, across the board regulations by 15% on the various income groups? Uh, we found that it would be equivalent to a, uh, basically a progressive income tax cut. If you look at the poorest 20% of households, it would be like a 2.27% cut in overall expenditures. If you look at the highest income Americans, even though they would save the most, the savings would amount to 0.77% of income. So that's, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I, think the, uh, I think a very key takeaway from that last uh, presentation by Dustin is the burden is greatest on the lowest 20% and that lowest 20% is having the hardest time getting off the sticky floor. So economic mobility is directly affected by this, uh, by by this set of findings, we have uh, we have microphones, I believe, located on either side of this hearing room, uh, and they are not to uh, just be there; they're for your questions. And we're going. Oh, good, excellent, excellent, right? Uh, so Sam, Sam has has that. Uh, if anyone has a question, that's good. If not, I have a question to start off the questioning. And my question goes to Pietro. I'd like you to say just a couple of words, if you would, how this uh, finding about reduced GDP affects labor and capital markets. Um, maybe just labor, labor, labor markets. What do the jobs affect, do you think? I know you didn't separately estimate that in the paper, but could you say a, a couple of words on that? Yes, first I want to connect to the example that Dustin gave, uh, how to think about growth rates. Perhaps rather than thinking U.S. versus Bangladesh, 
is an exercise that we always have on the grad to do, which is that if your growth rate is the real of 72, uh, that is a way of computing the doubling time, how long it takes to double your income if you're growing at 10% uh, per year. Uh, the rule says take 72 and divide it by the growth rate. So your income doubles ever, every 7.2 years. That's repeated uh, experience, experiencing repeated in your working lifetime, doubling of your income. If you're growing at 1%, income doubles uh, in uh, 70 years, probably the end of your lifetime. Definitely not within your working mm -hmm. lifetime. I think that that puts some flesh on the bones of what we're talking about here. In, uh, when Korea was growing at roughly 7, 7.5% per year, new Koreans, and Korea in 1953 was the poorest country in the world, uh, if not the poorest, the next poorest country in the world, the Koreans experience within their working lifetime, starting at 25, retiring at something like 70, uh, three or four episodes of doubling income. That's big. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. Now, on the on the labor market implications. In the paper, we didn't go there because we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I have um, the field that has explored the interaction between labor market and, um, and economic growth, of course. And it's very easy to extend uh, the type of analysis that we did, allowing for uh, increasing complications uh, or, or a richer structure of the labor market. You can go for, to an environment where there is a participation decision. So going after, for example, one of the starkest uh, features of the last eight years, which is the drop in participation rate. Uh, that's a, a very rare event to see, or the, something of the magnitude. You can allow for uh, an unemployment rate, uh, voluntary and involuntary, doesn't matter, and uh, look at these interactions. Uh, any kind of, uh, the, the kind of models that we use for these analysis are going to tell you that regulations, they reduce the level of activity are going to reduce uh, uh, incentives to participate in the labor force and probably are going to rise unemployment. Okay. Uh, so that can be done very quickly. On the estimation side, we would need additional data, but that's... Uh, so there's a significant impact on labor markets. So I just want to make that clear. D uh, uh, who would like to ask first question? Ron, Ron Bird. Uh, Ron? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's the remarkable impacts that uh, you've described for administrative regulations uh, make me wonder, could you in fact extend this analysis beyond the administrative regulation sphere and also look at the uh, volume of uh, restrictive laws passed by Congress, uh, by state legislatures, or uh, even uh, municipal uh, uh, governments? Uh, wh wh why the limitation of the analysis just to regulations? Adam, why don't you take a first sh swing at that? So I think um, at the federal level, um, laws really have been largely delegated down to bureaucracies in the sense that they actually show up more in regulations than they do necessarily in, in legislation. Um, so I know Patrick's done some work on like the Dodd-Frank Act, so that's one law, but it has a lot of restrictions associated with it. So um, I think that's a good place to start looking anyway when it comes to the federal level. As far as the local level, it's again, it's hard, it's all, it comes down to a lot to a measurement problem. It's hard to get data on local restrictions and local rules and stuff like that. Um, it's not necessarily publicly available in any kind of searchable format, so it involves a lot of you know, on-the-ground type of research, which could be very effective and is something that more should be done, but yeah, currently there's no like repository of data that makes it easy to necessarily analyze at the state and local level, but certainly something that um, we're actually trying to expand out and do more work on. Uh, Dustin or Pietro, do you have any views on that? or? The well, I, if you look at how uh, reg data was put together, I don't, we haven't really discussed that much, although many of you may be familiar with how that was done. Basically, it was a massive data mining exercise. Um, if you look at the Federal Register, you, you've got centralized, digitized copies of existing federal regulations, so you've got the existing data that you can then take in and you can data mine and actually extrapolate the number of regulations and even assign them to particular industries. As was pointed out, if you're looking at the state and local, they're spread out all over the place. So it's very difficult to have it in a workable format. It's something that I think we would like to do, and you, but it's, it's, a, it's a significant 
amount of resource, manpower, money in order to do okay. something like that. I want to make one more, but, but just to emphasize what you said, though, I think it is important because ultimately people, when they're thinking about starting a business, the first regulatory hurdle they run into is at the local level. They don't get to federal stuff usually until they've gotten that business license, till they've messed with the zoning laws in order to get the location for the business and all that kind of stuff. So certainly local level stuff is, is very important and something that needs to be studied more. Good. Yes, right down here, first row. Uh, like, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Roman Bueller with the Madison Coalition and the Regulation Freedom Amendment. Has anybody done any research on the, not the effect of regulations in place, but the fear of unpredictable and capricious future regulation as a disincentive to growth and investment and job creation? I guess I can answer that. Uh, n not in a macroeconomic environment, and, uh, but it will be done. We were discussing it at dinner last night with Patrick. Uh, we, we can do it. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody's done it. If it's been done on a more micro level, it's possible, but not in macroeconomic uh, context. Very good. I, I'm going to take the privilege of the last uh, question and ask Adam Millsap if regulatory differences explain why Florida has so many people and all, everyone in New York wants to go to Florida. <laughs> and the I think qu qu questions about population change. So, so to be fair, I, I think certainly um, regulations and job opportunities have something to do with it. Um, I actually, though, am a, am a firm believer that you should never discount things like weather uh, and climate when it comes to people's migration decisions. So, I think all else equal, regulation certainly matters. But I think. Um, even if New York was able to get their regular, they would have to be significantly better than Florida in order to deter people from uh, moving down. But that's something, that's actually one of the things they probably should be working for though, is because they, because they are at such a disadvantage when it comes to weather that they do have to be so much better along these other dimensions. Well, uh, please join me in thanking the participants of the first panel. Yeah.